This conference will now be recorded. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last of our 2020 EcoFoci seminar series. I am Heather Tabasola. I am the co-lead with Jens Nielsen, who is also on video today, and he's gonna be taking over today. This seminar is part of NOAA's EcoFoci biannual seminar series focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and US Arctic to improve understanding of ecosystem dynamics and applications of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. Since October 21st, 1986, the seminar has provided an opportunity for research scientists and practitioners to meet, present, develop their ideas, and provoke conversations on subjects pertaining to fisheries oceanography or regional issues in Alaska's marine ecosystems. You can visit the ECOFOSI webpage for more information at www.ecofoci.noaa.gov. And again, we sincerely thank you guys for joining us today for this season um, as we continue kind of this all virtual seminar series. This is the last uh, talk this season um, and our speaker lineup coming up can be found always by the One NOAA Science Seminar Series and also on the NOAA PMEL calendar of events. We are here Wednesdays at 10 a.m. and we should be beginning probably March 3rd. So look for details forthcoming in the new year. Please double check that your microphones are muted, that you are not on video. And then during the talk, please feel free to type your questions into the chat. Both Jens and I will be monitoring that and we'll address those at the end of the talks. And I'm gonna hand this over to Jens and he's gonna introduce and lead the seminar today. Jens, all you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you everyone for joining in. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Deanna Krauser. Um, Deanna is a zooplankton ecologist in our ecofoci group. And she has a variety of projects. She focuses on zooplankton identif identification, quality assessment. She works on the chlorophyll analyses and data analyses of those data. Um, she also knows three to four different programming languages. Um, which is very helpful when you happen to be her office mate. Um, and lately, which, uh, she's been leading the group's zooplankton imaging efforts, which I think we'll hear a little bit more about today, which is really, really cool work. Um, Deanna holds a degree in oceanography from University of Washington, and uh, she did her thesis work with Julie Keister and Daniel Grandbaum, and researched the effect of low oxygen levels and ocean ocean acidification on copepode size distributions. Um, I'm gonna swing it over to you, Deanna, right now because I know you're gonna talk about that. So go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jens. Hi, as Jens said, I'm Deanna Krauser. I'm a zooplankton ecologist here at NOAA. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the effects of climate change on zooplankton communities from my undergraduate research at the University of Washington to my current work here at NOAA's Alaska Fisheries Science Center. So as Jen said, I graduated from the University of Washington with my BS in oceanography in 2019. And for the first portion of this seminar, I'm going to present my undergraduate senior thesis, which investigated the effects of low oxygen levels on copepod size distribution with depth and hood canal. Hypoxia, a condition in which there is a decrease in the concentration of oxygen availability below two milligrams per liter, is an narrow on that marine life. Incidences of coastal hypoxia due to changes in nutrient loading have steadily been increasing over the years. According to recent studies, 415 oxygen depleted coastal systems have been identified worldwide. This condition is exacerbated by global warming through increased stratification and warming waters. Many coastal areas experience seasonal hypoxia due to high primary production, as well as stratification, which naturally leads to oxygen depletion as algal blooms decay in late summer and autumn. However, the increase in the strength of stratification promoted through global warming is extending the length of seasonal hypoxia. 
It has been documented that hypoxic events can lead to mass fish kills and fishery closures. However, subtler effects of hypoxia are reduced egg production of copepods. Altered community structure of mesozooplankton in Hood Canal has also been documented, a change which will likely affect the amount of energy transfer between trophic levels in the marine web. Unfortunately, a lot is unknown about how hypoxia affects each aspect of the marine web. Predators like fish can deal with the extension of seasonal hypoxic conditions by simply changing migration habits and avoiding low oxygen areas. However, drifting organisms like copepods pay a higher cost to exploit adaptive mechanisms that allow them to better deal with low oxygen conditions because they're less able to move away from affected areas. One adaptation of copepods is to adjust their vertical position within the water column. An example of this adjustment is style vertical migration when copepods occupy depths during the day and migrate to the surface to feed at night. Hypoxic conditions occur seasonally in Hood Canal a sub-basin of Puget Sound, Washington, making it a good place to study the effects of hypoxia. Hood Canal is a deep and narrow basin that makes up the entire western branch of Puget Sound. Um, at the northern end of Hood Canal, there is a long sill which limits ocean exchange and seasonally affects, affects hypoxia. In the fall, tidal intrusions bring in dense waters that sweep over the sill and flow into the basin. Stratification occurs as this cold and dense water sinks to the bottom of the basin and then displaces the less dense bottom water towards the surface of the water column. This displaced water, which is low in oxygen concentrations due to respiration and a lack of mixing, leads to a mid-water layer of hypoxic conditions. So the question I explicitly asked for this study was how do oxygen levels affect the community size distributions of copepods throughout the water column? And to answer this question, I need to determine two things. First, does oxygen affect the size distribution of where they are in the water column? Based on the theory that larger organisms require more oxygen than smaller organisms to function, I hypothesize that smaller organisms um, would, well, I hypothesize that copepod size kit uh, composition would increase with distance relative to the oxygen minimum. So something like this. And second, how Oxygen affect, how does oxygen affect the abundance of individuals? If oxygen concentrations were severely low, I hypothesize a decrease in the abundance of individuals present. So shifting into my method section, <laughs> samples were collected at Tawano Hood Canal on the 19th of August, 2017 and the 24th of September, 2018, above the RV Rachel Carson. A CPD sensor fitted with an annually calibrated dissolved oxygen sensor was cast to determine target depths of interest. Profiles used in this study were selected based on oxygen concentrations. Levels of interest range from hypoxic conditions, less than two milligrams per liter, to severe hypoxia, uh, which is less than one milligram per liter, based on previous research conducted on copepod behavior under low oxygen levels. Once target depths were identified based on the obtained oxygen profile above, within, and below the oxygen minimum zone, oblique multi-net toes were conducted day and night to observe dial vertical migration or DVM. Loading. <laughs> the plankton samples collected were preserved and returned to the laboratory for analysis. 
And in the laboratory, each zooplankton sample was quantitatively diluted and a subsample was taken for analysis. Each species of copepod within a subsample was counted and classified into five separate groups. Here is the CTD profile under normoxic conditions taken August 19, 2017 at 3.30 a.m. at Tawano Hood Canal, measuring oxygen concentration, temperature, chlorophyll, and salinity. The dashed lines here represent the depths in meters, um, and the y-axis represents the, um, well, the dashed lines, sorry, the dashed lines outline multi-net depth ranges, um, and the y-axis represents the depth in meters and the x-axis represents the respective units of conditions measured. Now, focusing on the oxygen profile represented by this green line, uh, we can see that conditions never fell below two milligrams per liter, which is why we'll use this profile as the control. And here, we have the CTD profile under hypoxic conditions. Well, that was taken on September 24th, 2018 at 6.45 a.m. Focusing on the oxygen profile, again, here in green, we can see concentrations fell well below the hypothetic threshold of two milligrams per liter. At the 10 meter, um, at 10 meters, we actually observed the oxygen minimum level where oxygen concentrations reach 0.25 milliliters, um, milligrams per liter, making it severely hypoxic conditions documented to significantly alter survival rates of copepods. Now, addressing my first question, does oxygen affect the size distribution of where they are in the water column? No, this is my size slide indicator. First, we'll look at the distribution for the average size of the copepods under both normoxic and hypoxic conditions. Um, at night, uh, which is depicted with the green bars, and during the day, which is depicted with the blue bars. The y-axis is the multi-net depth ranges in meters, and the x-axis is the prosome length of the copepods in millimeters. Copepod size distribution significantly differed among depth strata under normoxic conditions, so this entire profile from 2017 as well as under hypoxic conditions, but only during the day, so just the blue bars in this graph. There were no statistically significant differences in size distribution among depths at night under hypoxic conditions, so that's the green bars in this graph. So we had a pretty even size distribution at night, unlike our normoxic profile. Note the green, yellow, and red circles. These act as a reference and will be seen throughout my data to reflect normal, hypoxic, and severely hypoxic oxygen concentrations. The oxygen minimum of 0.25 milligrams per liter, again, occurred at 10 meters below the sea surface. And on average, net two, the 10 to 15 meter range had the lowest oxygen concentration of 0.68 milligrams per liter, making it severely hypoxic. Recalling my original hypothesis that I would find the smallest copepods occupying the oxygen minimum zone, and size would then increase with distance relative to the oxygen minimum zone, this is where I expected to observe the smallest copepods at night. This data did not support that hypothesis. I actually added these uh, little copepods that are proportioned in size to kind of give you an idea of what 0.64, or 0.62, or 0.61 meters look like. Um, so you can see these, are, it's really hard to distinguish the difference in size um, under hypoxic conditions. Um, and it's a little bit easier to tell that this uh, copepod right here um, under normoxic conditions is the largest and it kind of differs in size. So that's my, my um, statistically significant difference in size when it comes to copepods in the water column. I used box plots to describe the size distribution of copepods throughout the water column and identify outliers within my data. Here we have box plots under 
um, hypoxic conditions at night and during the day. The y-axis is the prosome length of the copepods in millimeters, and the x-axis is the multi-net depth ranges in meters. Under hypoxic conditions, numerous outliers shown as the blue circles were scattered throughout the water column at night, as you can see here. Um, the mean value of length shown as the x's um, was drawn up the most by outliers in the surface zero to five meters at night, so right here. During the day, there was an overall decrease in the number of outliers observed, with larger copepods shifting down and out of the uh, surface zero to five meters during the day. When compared to normoxic conditions, the length data was more normally distributed in most multinets during the night and day. So one of the things that was difficult here is the copepods have a very wide size distribution and there were a lot of outliers. And considering outliers drew up the average value of length data in each depth strata, I switched to looking at the median to get a better picture of the copepod size distribution with the y-axis representing the, cop the copepod prosome length in millimeters and the x-axis, wait, no, sorry, the y-axis is the multi-net depth ranges and the x-axis is the copepod prosome length, apologies. Again, recalling my original hypothesis, this is where I expected to observe the smallest copepods at night um, in the oxygen minimum zone the 10 to 15 meter range under hypoxic conditions. And this data still did not support that hypothesis. Now, moving on to my second question, how does oxygen affect the abundance of individuals? No, this is my abundance slide indicator. Uh, we're no longer talking about size, so temporarily forget about those graphs I just showed you. Um, regarding divertical migration, under normoxic conditions, we would expect to see copepods rise from the depths of the water column to the surface to feed. And that correlates to an observed population density highest in the surface waters at night, when light intensity has no influence on size distribution and lowest during the day, as copepods migrate deeper and darker to, to deeper and darker depths to avoid predation. Here we have um, two graphs of the estimated copepod abundance per cubic meter under normoxic and hypoxic conditions, day represented as the yellow bars and at night represented as the blue bars. The y-axis represents the depth in meters and the x-axis represents the density determined as population size per cubic meter. Note the oxygen concentration indicators my little, my dot. So again, right here in these two um, depth stratas, we had severely hypoxic um, conditions and we just had hypoxic here. So that's a little less than two, um, two milligrams per liter. And it was overall um, normal oxygen profile um, in a zero five meter range. Here we have a similar graph with normoxic, the orange and blue. Uh, and the lower hypoxic yellow and gray conditions overlapped to emphasize the difference. The y-axis depicts the multi-net number with five being at the surface and one being at depth. Now, remember the, um, I'm shifting to multi-net numbers because the depth ranges are custom to each oxygen profile. Um, so because I'm looking at normoxic compared to hypoxic, the depth range is a little different. So I'm just gonna show you um, the, the multi-net range. Um, under normoxic conditions, the orange and blue, we found evidence to support the theory of dial vertical migration with the highest abundance in the surface zero to five meters at night and shifting down and um, in the water column as ambient light is introduced. Under hypoxic conditions, the yellow and gray, we did not observe the traditional dial vertical migration behavior population density was actually highest in the hypoxic layers at night. So that's multi-nets three and two and lowest during the day. Meaning 
a large proportion of the population did not make it to the surface at night under hypoxic conditions. This observed copepod abundance may support two previous studies theorizing that copepods may exploit the oxygen minimum as predation refuge. However, it's very curious why we observed a drastic shift in abundance from night to day, uh, just above the oxygen minimum in Multinet 3. The hang up with our sampling method is we can't determine if the copepods are hanging out to avoid predation or if they're dead. So the null hypothesis that size does not vary with distance relative to the oxygen minimum layer could not be rejected following the results of this study. However, we did find that the vertical distribution of copepods was significantly altered with an even distribution of size um, at night under hypoxic conditions compared to normoxic conditions and relatively large copepods occupying the oxygen minimum during both day and night, which is um, contradictory to a 2017 study on krill that observed the largest species in areas where oxygen concentrations were the highest. And regarding dial vertical migration, our abundance data support the theory of DVM under both normoxic and hypoxic conditions. However, DVM was fundamentally altered under hypoxic conditions, which is contradictory of a 2009 study, which concluded the oxygen minimum layer affected DVM, but did not prevent it. My theory is under hypoxic conditions, copepods attempted BD DVM at night, but majority got caught in the oxygen minimum layer and either migrated back down to depth as ambient light was introduced or died and settled down the water column. If the vertical distribution of the size of copepods is significantly changed, this could affect predator and prey interactions and alter the transfer of energy throughout the marine food web. We observed a shift in copepod size with a more even distribution and size throughout the water column under hypoxic conditions relative to normoxic conditions. These larger copepods here at the, high, um, at the higher surface levels have a, risk, a higher risk of being eaten by visual predators. If their distribution, if they're distributed different, differently, they can be exposed to different predators, which will affect the, which will alter the food web dynamics. We also observed a decrease in abundance of copepods present in the surface layers under hypoxic conditions due to either mortality rates or predator avoidance. It's unclear at this point. If predators do not adjust their position in the water column, they'll need to migrate to a new location in search of prey leaving a niche open for a new predator to occupy. But what if predators are unable to adapt to low oxygen availability? This will lead to a shift in predatory species in favor of those more tolerant to low oxygen levels who may have different predation behavior like jellyfish or other gelatinous species. Since graduation, I've continued to work with Drs. Keister and Grunbaum to develop an imaging system to observe zooplankton swimming behavior in situ with the hopes to add more data to this study. Net toes are just snapshots in time, but with imaging, we can look up and down the water column to get a better idea of what's happening beneath the surface. An imaging system was deployed on the Tawana Orca mooring from May through September from 2017 to 2018 to monitor zooplankton abundance, vertical distribution, and small scale movement behaviors from prior to the onset of hypoxia through peak hypoxic conditions. This system profiled the water column several times a day to resolve changes in distributions on dial to seasonal timescales. We also built and deployed an array of low cost video cameras on Lagrangian drifters at four depths to concurrently study the behaviors and distributions of zooplankton throughout the water column and the hours surrounding sunrise each day to capture zooplankton vertical migrations from surface to depth when they're most likely to experience changes from favorable to unfavorable conditions. Dr. Grunbaum developed a low-cost plankton imager to be mounted to the Lagrangian drifters, which included a camera, an infrared illuminator, and battery pack. 
which was constructed using only off-the-shelf and 3D printed parts. This imager can collect up to 60 gigabits of video uh, during a 24-hour autonomous deployment. I personally work with an array of still images collected from the orca moorings. Particles that fit a predetermined size threshold are identified and isolated for manual classification. And here is a screenshot of the classification interface we're using, which allows us to quickly sift through and identify species of interest observed in the water column. Like copepods and filter feeders like larvations. Here you can see one in its mucus house. Um, medusa and siphonophores that can better withstand hypoxic conditions relative to other predators, and even euphausids. All of the classified ROIs have their own corresponding timestamps, depths, and CTD profiles associated with them, so we're able to identify the specific conditions we're observing them under. It's truly some really exciting work that we're doing right now, and getting beautiful images like these are the highlight of my job. The skills I gained working with Dr. Julie Keister and Dr. Danny Grumbaum, their graduate students, Sasha Soroy and Amy Wyatt, and the training I obtained from their research scientist and technician, Amanda Winans and Bethany Herman, have made the transition to my work here at NOAA seamless. So I owe a big thank you to them. And I know a few of them have tuned in in support of me here today. So thank you, ladies. Now, for the second portion of this presentation, I'll share my current work here at NOAA, where we have been, where I've been given the opportunity to further my skills in taxonomy and image, image analysis. I'm actually a contractor with Linker at NOAA's Alaska Fisheries Science Center and the Race Division here in Seattle. Now, I'm going to cover a lot of topics and jump around a bit. So here's an outline so you know what to expect. Um, I'll go over my contracted tasks at NOAA, um, then I'll shift into my research focuses, um, which are in relation to climate change, universal responses to global warming, and using ecosystem indicators. Then I'll go over research objectives using imaging analysis, um, from my data collection to the software we're going to use, um, as well as implications of our findings um, for this overall health of our ecosystems. All right, so here we go. A large portion of my work here consists of zooplankton identification. NOAA has been in collaboration with the Plankton Sorting and Identification Center located in Szczecin, Poland for 45 years. The department was funded and was founded in 1974 following the signing of an intergovernmental agreement between the Sea Fisheries Institute in Gdynia, Poland, and the National Marine Fisheries Service in Woods Hall, USA. This creation, of the, this creation of this sorting center was actually stimulated by a 50% decrease of bottom and pelagic fish resource biomasses in the Northeast Atlantic in the 70s. Currently, there are about 10 highly skilled women that work here who process over 7,000 zooplankton samples a year from all over the world. So you can see the, um, the orange is all the different oceans that they um, process samples from. All of the zooplankton samples we collect here at ASFC are shipped to Poland, where every specimen is identified, sorted, and recorded. And then they're shipped back here to Seattle, where Jesse Lim and I QAQC this data through a verification process. The samples are then stored in our archive room, where we have records of specimens dating all the way back to the late 80s. So this is what my normal day-to-day -day work looks like here at NOAA. Now I'm going to shift to my research and what I'm really interested in, which is looking at climate change in Alaska's ecosystems. The marine ecosystem off Alaska's coast sustain North America's richest fisheries. Alaska exports more than 1 million metric tons of seafood each year, bringing in over $3 billion worth of new money into the US economy. Warming ocean temperatures, which peaked in 2015, are believed to have had a major effect on the health of our fisheries. 
Now, there are many things that can affect plankton growth, which is really important to our ecosystems because it sets up the base of the lower food web. One of the effects of warming waters is we're beginning to see an early sea ice retreat on the Eastern Bering Sea shelf. And this early sea ice retreat is triggering an early spring algal bloom. Now, zooplankton vary their activities and reproduction according to the season. And we believe the timing of the spring bloom is critical to them. It's when and how they get the nutrition they need for egg production. The mismatch of when food is available and when zooplankton come out of diapause and search for that food could send ripples up the food chain. So this is just one of the things that I'm currently looking at but I'm not gonna talk more about this today. Instead, I'm gonna focus on zooplankton and how they serve as an important link to the overall health of our ecosystems. One of the many things that I'm really interested in um, are the universal responses to global warming. Now, the first two bullet points are pretty well documented that we'll see responses to phenology and range species shifts. But this third one is still hypothesized with only some evidence to support it. And when you consider the effects of a small zooplankton body size across ecosystems, there's even less evidence at hand. So it's really an interesting topic to focus on for our seas that we monitor here at AFSC. We researched some well-mixed nutrient-rich seas. And an example of this is the Bering Sea Shelf, which tends to have this period of really strong mixing when you get phytoplankton blooms and then it stratifies. Um, you'll see a division in the water column into layers with different densities, which inhibits nutrient flux. Now, if we begin to see an extension in the length of stratification or how long it lasts, then we're gonna see a shift toward this more stratified nutrient limited situation, which in turn will affect the food web in terms of overall carbon and energy flow. Looking at global trends in phytoplankton size, we can see the smallest phytoplankton are observed near the equator where sea surface temperatures are warmer and increasing in size as we move towards the poles and temperature decreases. This is where we expect to observe highly productive ecosystems at the poles um, in the Arctic and Antarctic. Now, focusing on zooplankton size in relation to warming. A study conducted in 2015 tested temperature-induced shifts towards smaller body size and lower abundances under warming conditions by performing a mesocosm experience, uh, experiment using plankton from the Baltic Sea at three temperature levels, so 9.5, 13.5, and 17.5 degrees Celsius. Look at the average biomass of edible plankton, uh, phytoplankton. There's an overall decrease in the biomass regardless of temperature. So we know over time in a mesocosm, zooplankton are grazing on phytoplankton. Now, looking at the average biomass of adult acarsia, a species of copepod, over time, we see the coldest temperatures, the, op the open circles, they have the most biomass, but in the warmest temperature, the boxes, they have the smallest biomass. So acarsia growing under cold conditions are eating the same amount of food in relation to those growing under, under warming conditions, but they're bigger. There's more biomass, roughly 50% more biomass. Now, again, this is just biomass. So to confirm they actually are getting smaller, we'll look at this third graph that describes the average prozone length the length of the body excluding the tail. Looking at 19, the 9.5 degrees Celsius and 13.5 degrees Celsius, we can see that the adults, these unfilled circles, are the largest. But when we look at the warmer temperatures, 17.5 degrees Celsius, we can see their prozone length is down about 100 microns. 
So they become more compressed as temperatures warm. And it also gets less easy to distinguish between the C5, the filled triangles, and the adult stage. The warmth is reducing their size. Their higher metabolic rates are inhibiting their ability to accumulate biomass. So this is what happened in a mesocosm. Based on this, what's going to happen in the Bering Sea with Calanus, another species of copepod? If we extrapolate that data out to the Bering Sea, the individual cell size of phytoplankton may be smaller, but overall, there may not be major changes in relation to phytoplankton biomass. Okay. But if it gets warmer, we're going to have a population of calanus that are typically rich in lipid content decrease in size. And what we expect to see is size de decreases is the amount of lipid, which is energy in the system could go down and the size of the individuals could go down as well. So this is, um, this is the lipid sac inside of a calanus. It's this little, little blob. It's kind of hard to see, um, but just like a little, little water drop. Um, if, the, if the size of the individuals go down, this is going to affect how much energy is available to higher trophic levels. So how can we get some indications of whether or not this is happening? Are they getting smaller? Are they less full of fat with less biomass? And how can we measure that? As it turns out, there is information that we can extract using specific size indicators. One is looking at the lipid sac um, and, and looking at the lipid size. So again, here, these are the little, this is the lipid sac. We've got one right here, right here. They're, they're a little hard to see, but once you, once you get it, you, you can point them out. And um, we can use the lipid size as a proxy for biomass, because even if copepods are the same size, the amount of lipid content may vary. And lipid content is really important because it supplies overwintering provisioning for fish. We also have the ability to look at body sizes. If there is a change in body size measurements, we will observe a bottom up trophic effect and fish will need to eat more zooplankton to get the same amount of nutrients as they did in the past. With image software, we can actually measure both of these things, the size of the lipid droplet and the body size. I'm now going to discuss my research objectives, which rely upon utilizing imaging analysis to identify trends in zooplankton size over time in Alaska's ecosystems. Keep in mind, I'm just getting started with this research, so this is just going to be a general overview and some early shots of what we're working on. First, we're working on the development of new ecosystem indicators based on zooplankton size. We'll generate images using shipboard as well as in situ imaging. Next, in collaboration with Jen Olberger, our goal is to determine if zooplankton size has changed over time. And we'll do this by utilizing our archive samples that we have here on campus. And the most exciting is we're hoping to develop artificial algorithms to identify species automatically using a variety of deep learning networks and a potential collaboration with Google. Now I'm going to show you how we're going to do this. In 2015, AFSC implemented a method for an at-sea rapid zooplankton assessment, RZA, to provide leading indicator information on zooplankton composition in Alaska's large marine ecosystems. It was developed in order to provide information for our ecosystem status reports that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This rapid assessment is a quick sort and identification of the zooplankton community and provides preliminary estimates of zooplankton abundance and community structure. Through RZA, we'll be able to generate a number of images just using a simple microscope cell phone adapter. And with these images collected at sea, we can analyze and extrapolate size data using imaging software. We're also working in collaboration with Calvin Morty and NOAA PMEL's Innovative Technology for Arctic Exploration team 
to use this really, really cool continuous particle imaging classification system, which features embedded processing and region of interest extraction. It's capable of standalone deployment on CTD rosettes, as well as via autonomous platforms or vehicles. This camera system is already trained in biodiversity of plankton and can automatically classify 22 species using deep learning. Once we've collected images at sea and in situ, we can use the Image Pro 10 software to batch process and extrapolate a wide variety of size descriptors, as well as estimate lipid content volume. This software has the ability to identify regions of interest using a color contrast threshold, as well as the option to classify objects in order to train the program to become automated once a large library of images are loaded into the system. We've also recently received funding through the NPRB to research the effects of warming on copepod size in the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea. Both areas support important commercial and subsidence fisheries. We'll utilize three decades of archived samples to generate images of selected species of copepods. And we'll be using the Image Pro software I just showed you to analyze these images in order to quantify the effects of long-term warming on copepod sizes. And finally, as I mentioned, we're hoping to develop artificial algorithm, al algorithms. We'll be able to take all of these images generated via the RZA, CPIX, the NPRB project, as well as a vast collection of images that are being generated in Poland in lieu of samples we were unable to collect this year, and begin classifying them in order to identify species automatically using a variety of deep learning networks and potential collaboration with Google, which is really exciting and may also put me out of a job, but I think that's a way down the way. <laughs> this imaging work is just getting started, but if our hypotheses are confirmed and plankton are getting smaller across Alaska's ecosystems, It'll mean there's less biomass and lipid content available to fish and indicates a potential link to global warming. And if we know that, we'll know that under future warming conditions, the decrease in zooplankton size will only continue and get worse. And if our developed ecosystem indicators confirm copepod size or limpet content is in decline, Implications for our ecosystem conditions that given year are not good for fish and in turn, not good for our fisheries. Well, I hope over the past 38 minutes, I've been able to convince you about how important zooplankton are. As I mentioned, this work is just getting started, but I truly look forward to sharing my findings with you in the future. Um, I want to give a special acknowledgement to Dave Kimmel, Jesse Lamb, Colleen Harpel, Kimberly Ball, Adam Spear, and Libby Lagerwell for my help um, training me and getting me set up here at NOAA and helping me with this presentation. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, you'll get the round of applause that Heather usually does. Um, we have time for questions, so please, if you have um, all the 110, or I guess there are 99 left, huge crowd. If anybody has questions, please um, put them in the chat box. We'll start with one from Ned Kokolet, who is asking about your uh, Twano work. I'm just wondering, he says, how deeply the light penetrated during the day and its relationship to the depths of your plankton toes? Well, the, um, the graphs of profiles were mostly um, just looking at the oxygen concentration. So I didn't spend time looking at the light penetration. I am assuming it's not, it's it's deep in Tawano, but it's deeper in other areas of Hood Canal. Um, so I'm not exactly sure exactly how deep it is, but I wanna say it's probably within the top 20 meters, probably a little bit less. There's a lot of, there's a lot of productivity. So um, the, the the waters are really rich with phytoplankton, so I'm not sure that the, the light concentration gets down really low. Um, but 
it's a really good question. I, uh, I wanna keep adding on to my senior thesis with hopes of publishing it. So I'm gonna remember that question and make sure I answer it in my paper. There's another question from Diana who says, thank you. At what depths are you hoping to set up the autonomous surveys? So I'm assuming that's the, uh, the latest work you just talked about. Yeah, um, I, I'm a professional when it comes to identifying the, um, the plankton that we see and, you know, creating the algorithm. So I'm not exactly sure. I know that Calvin Morty may be on the line as well as Dave Kimmel and they might have more details. But I'm hoping that my, my assumption is that we're hoping to um, profile the entire water column um, or as, as much as we can. Specifically, you thought it's correct. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a question from Hassan. Diana, could you elaborate about training data for machine learning algorithms that you mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm just getting started when it comes to machine learning using the Image Pro 10 software. And um, because I'm just starting to load and generate image libraries, um, the systems the software is not able to automatically identify yet, but when I do load in my software, if you notice in the picture that had the copepods that were highlighted in blue, um, when I highlight them, I have the option to set a classification and I tell the program, this is a copepod, or I can even be more specific if I wanted to, but in the beginning, I'm going to be really general just to make sure that I can train the system. And I'll say, this is a copepod or this is a euphalzid, and I set the class. So when it goes through, I batch process. So I'll do a bunch of copepods all at one time and say, these are all copepods. And then all of the data that it spits out gets saved into a special learning file that the system software creates. And once we get enough images loaded into it, the system will be able to learn and identify and reference back to those images that I already provided to the system. So we need a lot of images to do this um, um, with the AI. And also, even if we do collaborate with Google, um, the goal is we have to dump a lot of images in. So we're just in the beginning of generating these images. So I expect most of the next year to be making just getting as many images as we can to train all the systems. All right, next question is from Patricia, I think. Yeah. You state that the temperature is warm and zooplankton may become smaller. However, do you think there'll be an increased abundance of the zooplankton because of warming? Uh, there could be less lipids per individual because of the smaller size, but there may be an increase in numbers that could make up for that. Good point. Yeah, um, uh, I'm just trying to shift between my. Um, I think of warming and hypoxia. That's undergrad. So warming in the in the Bering Sea, um, there could be a change in abundance. Um, it depends. Let me think this one through. If it's warmer, metabolic rates. They spend more time um, in the lower sizes. I think the higher metabolic rates might prevent them. From growing and it might limit egg production. So I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Dave might have a little bit more insight about that, but um, yeah, good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So there is a paper out there that does spec, I should put my camera on, sorry. Sorry, um, yeah, there's a paper out there that speculates just that, that there's going to be a shift in species composition and you may get more zooplankton, but they're smaller. My concern with that is that if they're different species, they don't accumulate as much lipid. So they might have smaller amounts of lipid and there might be more of them, but um, they might be of different sizes, which affects the predator prey mass ratio and the trophic transfer. So yeah, there's some competing hypotheses out there that there will be sort of increases in the overall abundance as it warms. But the, I think you know, for this ecosystem, the type of species does matter because the fish have evolved to, to use that as a, as a particular food source. So uh, yeah, great, great question. So, yeah, I'll shut up, sorry. No, thank you. Thank you, dude. Uh, next one is from Jim Overland, who says, how strong are your bearing implications based on 2018 and 19? And I'm thinking that he really, he's thinking about this very warm years and how that may have impacted the zooplankton. Do you know this yet? Or are you still looking at data? Um, when it comes to imaging, I don't know this yet. I haven't looked at data, but in regards to papers, I haven't, 
I need to read more papers. Dave might know a little bit more about that too. <laughs> so we, we don't know yet, but we have uh, zooplankton in hand that she's gonna image and measure. So she just got started on that. So we hope to have an answer on that relatively soon. Yeah. Um, I'm expecting to see some pretty dramatic size shifts. Um, you know, even with a car show, which is not a very big copepod, they saw about a hundred micrometer change, and that copepod is only about a millimeter in size. Uh, the calanus are triple to four times that, so I expect to see some of those changes. At least that's the hypothesis. So I we'll see. We'll be yeah. <laughs> Diana just started measuring those. Yeah, I started looking um, at 2012 to 2015 data, um, I want to say last week, and my first initial response was we had a lot of, um, it was a shift in, in, um, in sex, we had a lot more females and we saw males relative to most of the years that we saw, and there were um, less uh, adult C5 um, copepods that were present, which was really, really surprising. Um, and um, yeah, it kind of threw us for a loop. So I had to kind of recalibrate a little bit and figure out what to do when we had a really big shift and what we expected to see um, when it came to who we measure and who we image. All right, we're gonna keep moving here. So Melanie says, in the Salish Sea study, you showed an O2 reading of 0 0.25 milligrams per liter. Did you ever hit anything that low? Also, did you approach that study with any info about metabolic differences between younger, smaller copepods and larger ones? Um, so, did I, um, the question, did I find um, any oxygen concentrations that low in relation to other conditions or another profile? I think I missed that part right there. Um, I didn't expect oxygen concentrations to get that low, but it's great that it did. There weren't really a lot of studies that um, kind of went that low in oxygen concentration. So it was really nice to kind of see that out. Um, I did do research into the metabolic difference and I also did kind of look into species availability. Um, I looked at five different species of copepod that we found in that area and they all do have significantly different um, behavioral differences, size differences, um, and there is going to be um, implications in regards to the metabolic process, you know, with warmer waters um, and hypoxia, um, I expect there to be um, different behavior. Um, that's something I didn't elaborate in, in my initial run on my senior thesis, but that is something that I plan on spending time on making sure that I have um, a large kind of section because it's really important because the, the implications of my data weren't very conclusive and it was kind of surprising. And I, I say, you know, that's probably what I'm going to have to rely on next. I looked at body size and abundance. I need to now shift towards species abundance, exactly who's there and what the difference is between the metabolic rates. So yeah, it's a great question. Next, uh, a good question here from Al Herman. Under warming, both zooplankton and fish may experience heightened metabolism. Has reduced zooplankton could be due to both their own increased respiration or and heightened predation from fish, hunger fish. Any thoughts on which will be more important? Mm. <laughs> nice, easy one. <laughs> um, no, I don't have any. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a little biased. You know, I think, you know, what happens with the zooplankton are the most important. I mean, the, the trophic energy transfer is only 10% from each trophic level. So, you know, if the metabolic rates and the size of the copepods are different, phytoplankton biomass is a little different. Um, I expect it to be the, you know, just the main driver of what happens to the rest of them. So even if even if the fish are affected by it, I think that they may be affected by the, but I think their biggest effect will be because of their food availability. I think the, yeah, I'm a little biased. This is zooplankton, they're most important. <laughs> And then let's see here. We have Patricia saying production increases with temperature. I think that relates to the earlier uh, discussion about uh, lower sizes, but potentially higher production per individual. Um, yeah. If you want to add anything to that, I think we kind of covered it. Um, let's see. Another question from Jenna. What kind of tech is on deck for the surveys? Does the unit collect or take microscopic imagery? If it is capturing images to get finite details, what onboard camera um, technology does it have? I'm interested in learning more about the abilities capturing data in a highly productive area. 
Yeah. Um, well, um, the CPIX is um, something that is with Calvin Morty's group and PMEL. Um, I, they're able to collect images. I'm not sure that they're microscopic. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I've just been able to, you know, kind of stalk around the, the website's um, specs of the camera. Um, but right now, when it comes to in situ work, that's the camera that we have working on. And then we plan to pull on board and take microscopic pictures on board. So whatever we catch in our nets and look at under the microscope while we're on board, um, we'll use the microscope for that. Um, so yeah, I, it's really exciting. I'm really excited about it too. Definitely reach out to, to Dave and Calvin and they'll, they're gonna probably talk to you about it more. Yeah, I can, I can add to that, that no, I also recently got a, I always get the name wrong, but basically similar type of approach to take uh, phytoplankton images, which I think will also be tested next year. A phyto something bot or something like that. Um, Jeanette Gann, I don't know if she's on, is, is sort of the expert on that. So um, let's see, moving on. Patricia says, thanks for pres presenting interesting work. I do zooplankton work in the Great Lakes. So I appreciate all the fellow zooplankton nerds. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm super excited for zooplankton on the <laughs> I was just going to mention that uh, uh, the camera should be in, uh, here in time for the spring morning cruise. Uh, so we'll put it on the CTD and have it uh, uh, collect uh, images while we're uh, doing the net samples. And uh, hopefully that all works. And then we will have it on the fall cruise through the Bering Sea up through the Arctic, doing the same thing on the CTD. Um, if everything looks good, we'll be thinking about uh, other applications on, on moorings. So we'll see how that goes. Dave, do you have anything else to add to that? No, um, just that, uh, yeah, it's coming. It should be here in January. We're going to put it through its paces in Puget Sound. And uh, um, and the other thing is we're really um, relying on Poland to produce annotated images. We had a, a question earlier about artificial intelligence. You know, one of the main rate limiting steps there is getting training data sets. So what, what we're doing with our colleagues is Poland is they're producing the images that are already sorted and annotated and hopefully building up that library so we can produce artificial intelligence algorithms that are a little bit more annotated because many of these uh, software limitations are due to the fact that training sets are just really laborious to produce. So uh, we're hoping to get by that by, by helping with, with uh, our, our colleagues in Poland. So we're really excited to converge all of this different uh, activities and technology that, that Deanna's sitting at, at, at the nexus of to, to help us advance this science. So we're, we're very excited to get out in the field next year and, and do some of this. And will you be on, will either of you be on the spring morning cruise? Do you have plans for that or is there still uh, uh, COVID concerns? And, <laughs> so I, I have indicated that I would like to go on the cruises where the camera is deployed as the main dude to help okay. with that. Well, we'll see uh, how, that, how that works. Yeah, um, we're, we're gonna try, Calvin, to get it, you know, working with Jeff and I over, over the winter and then uh, Deanna is going to be involved with that with us and make sure that we have two folks that know uh, inside and out how to work with the camera and the software in the field. So meaning so. just some uh, dock deployments. Yep, dock deployments, uh, maybe a little um, uh, small boat action if we can try it uh, to get to get this thing in the water and try to take some images and and Julie Keister's on the line somewhere and she's got some cool images of Puget Sound plankton. So if we get some cool pictures there, we might be able to compare to some of the work that she's done. So we're, yeah, we're we're very excited about this and, and hoping to have uh, folks in the field that are gonna be working with this stuff closely with you, Cal. And then we also had the Google team actually come to PMEL and give us a, a, a show and tell of their uh, AI system. It's quite impressive. Yeah, and we need, you know, we just need images. We need images that are annotated to begin training the system. And that's really the, yeah, that, that's really the, the port we're, we're looking forward to. So, so Deanna has been really instrumental in moving this, this uh, needle on this. We've been sort of talking about this for a while, but we haven't had people in here to work on it. And Deanna's just really jumped right in and, and grabbed the bull by the horn. So looking forward to it. Perfect. I'm going to, um say thank you to everybody for tuning in it's past 11. uh thank you so much again diana this was awesome um we will see you in the echo full size seminars hopefully in the beginning of march thank you everyone thanks everyone for coming bye